it's a pleasure to be with all of you here today and uh, virtually and uh, to really talk about uh, 2018 textbook and course material survey. Uh, we are finalizing the final, the, the, the main report, the full report, and should have that out very shortly, but uh, this is an opportunity for us to share some of the major findings of this year's survey. As most of you know, working in higher education, we are in an interesting environment now in terms of the higher education model. We are seeing a continued rise in tuition and fees across the country. In fact, for one of the first times last year, over 50% of the states are now relying more on tuition and fees to fund their operation than they are on appropriations from state legislators. Uh, that is a, a concerning trend. Uh, when you couple that together with student loan debt, which uh, many of you probably know is at one and a half trillion dollars across the country, uh, there is a general loss of confidence in higher education, and that is really uh, sort of aimed around the cost of, of, of uh, getting an education and then uh, finding a job uh, that will support not only the student in their, in their life, but in order to pay back student loans if they've taken those out. Uh, in Florida, about 53% of the graduates of our college and universities graduate with student loan debt, and the average student loan debt is somewhere around uh, $23,000. So um, many people have written across the country that the current situation in terms of tuition and fees student loans, uh, and the general higher education model is simply not sustainable, and we are seeing a lot of institutions look at some new ways that they can uh, perhaps uh, look at uh, ways to uh, provide an education to students in a, in a more uh, cost-efficient way. As a result, we're uh, seeing a large focus across our country on affordability, uh, and that has to do with not only new tuition models, but um, obviously the costs that are borne by students in terms of fees and textbooks. Uh, and textbooks have been an issue for several years now. A lot of us have been studying this and looking at ways that we can mitigate some of the costs of some of the textbooks for students. And obviously we've seen in the last, uh, probably the last three to four years, a rise in the use of open educational resources. and. Uh, uh, we also are, are hearing that we think that open educational resources are reaching a tipping point where it's beginning to really take off. And so that's good news, uh, not only for students, but in terms of our own uh, faculty and their experience with those uh, resources are finding uh, some great benefits. So with that in mind, another bit of history, the Florida Virtual Campus uh, sort of got into this uh, uh, in an interesting way. We started in 2004 in creating a learning object repository uh, to uh, ease the cost and uh, difficulty of developing online courses and programs. And as we started to populate that learning object repository called the Orange Grove, we started to find open educational resources in textbooks. And many of these textbooks were commercial textbooks that had been no longer published and the faculty members had retained the rights and then they uh, were releasing that through Creative Commons and making it available to anyone to use. So over the course of a year or two, we all of a sudden discovered that we had well over 500 uh, open uh, textbooks available that students could use. Uh, we were fortunate to get some funding uh, from the Fund for the Improvement for Post-Secondary Education to continue the work and in looking into the use of not only learning objects but open educational resources and that spurred us to do some of our first work in surveying students. Um, so the survey that we're going to talk about today was first administered in 2012. There have been three administrations of the survey in Florida. Uh, we typically administer it every two years or by request or by an institution. And we have done it primarily through our public institutions, our universities and colleges in the state and trying to get a snapshot or a look at what student experience is with textbooks and material costs and how that is impacting their success in courses, their choices, and generally degree completion. Um, 
Essentially, to participate, it's very simple. Uh, we ask the institution to sign a participation agreement to designate a liaison to work with our office in, uh, in administering the survey. Uh, the institutions can submit demographic questions, that some that can be included in the survey. And we ask the institutions to use their best communication channels. We don't specifically, or we don't specify how they should distribute the survey. We just ask them to use whatever uh, usual or normal methods that they uh, use to communicate with their students to distribute the survey and uh, to at least send one reminder uh, during the course of the survey, which typically is about 60 days uh, to the students and get them to fill that out. We have found that students are more than interested in filling this out, so participation has been quite good in most cases. Um, we prepare the survey and host it and provide a link to the institution, and then uh, and, uh, sort of our agreement is that once the survey is complete, we will provide each in participating institution with their own raw data and frequencies uh, and analysis that they can then use for their campus and then we will distribute the report uh, widely and we use aggregated data uh, for our reporting process. So this, uh, in 2018, uh, the participation in the, in the, in the survey was uh, approximately 21,000 uh, students. Uh, they were public and university students participating. All of our public institutions participated in 2018. In other words, all of them had students that clicked the link and took part of the survey or all of the survey. Um, and the, uh, the system level invitations to participate went out to the uh, university system and college system provost. The questionnaire is by design fairly short. Uh, there are only 14 questions and it takes 10 minutes or less to complete the survey, which is by design and we find that that's been useful in uh, keeping our numbers high for participation. Um, so sort of let's get into the data and what we saw. Um, this is the way we ask questions to the students about cost. We give them sort of categories to check into. Um, we have explored a number of ways to do this, and this way has been sort of the best and easiest way, we think, for students to respond. Um, so um, generally, they click a category or uh, a category that best describes the amount of money they think that they spent on textbooks and learning materials. When we looked at uh, cost by major, which is something we tried to do this year, uh, there were no particular surprises here. We, uh, if you look through this data, they're categorized in two categories, 0 to 300 and 301 or higher in terms of the cost data. Um, but the higher, uh, I'd say the higher cost uh, is in business and health sciences, uh, and then lower cost seems to be education, humanities, communications design. Um, we were not particularly surprised by this data. It, it sort of meets in with what we were hearing anecdotally from institutions and students and faculty. Uh, but it was a good question to ask and to kind of go through uh, this analysis. Uh, in terms of cost, for the first time in uh, the administration of the survey, this year in 2018, we actually saw a slight trend toward lower. In other words, more students were indicating that they spent, uh, the dollars that they spent could be categorized in the zero to $300 category versus being above $300. Um, it was uh, uh, sort of a trend there for this year, and we think that that is in response to not only the growing interest and awareness of open educational resources, but uh, most of our institutions in Florida have started or have well underway uh, efforts to uh, to use open educational resources. Some are pursuing, uh, pursuing the Z degree initiatives where entire degree programs don't have textbook costs to them. And there is generally uh, an increase in the use of digital resources inside of the learning management system. And we think all of those things are contributing to students having probably spending less than they were previously in 2012 and 2016, as they indicated, on textbooks or trending toward lower cost, which is good news. Um, one of the questions that we like to ask students is uh, what they're doing to mitigate the cost of textbooks. And uh, these are 
Like these are the responses that they were offered. Uh, uh, these are tried and true ones. In other words, we've asked these uh, for, for two previous administrations and we've not discovered. There may be some other ones that we're not aware of, but these are the typical ones that are most often uh, indicated in talking with students about how they are managing textbook costs. These are the ones that they typically mention to us in terms of how they, they do that. Uh, the data are, uh, for this year's administration, uh, the data is uh, interesting in the sense that we found that more students are uh, willing to, uh, to use a rental. Uh, if you look down about uh, two-thirds of the way down the, the graph there, you'll see that uh, rented textbooks uh, seem to have grown. I guess it's rent digital textbooks. If you look 2018 survey, 41.4% indicated that they were renting digital textbooks. That's a significant increase over 29.6% in the 2016 survey. Um, we think that students are more accepting of rental programs uh, as rental programs have been around for a little bit longer. Also, the rental programs, the original rental programs, some of the early ones, did not allow students to write in textbooks or highlight in those textbooks. And uh, so uh, a lot of students weren't attracted to them for that reason. Now, a lot of the rental programs are fairly open. Students can write in textbooks and they can use the textbooks as if they own that textbook. And so I think that has uh, given rise to more uh, acceptance of rental programs. Uh, and there may be some spread of rental programs in uh, campus bookstores as well. We see a slight increase uh, in a number of these categories, buying used copies, buying books from a source other than the campus bookstore, which is sort of a well-known one. Uh, a lot of people go to Amazon and other sources on the web to do that. Uh, so in a sense, the students were looking at the options presented to them to avoid the cost uh, uh, more favorably, and certainly rental was the story here. In terms of impact uh, on their academic career, which is a major concern and one of the reasons why, one of the major reasons why we started looking at uh, doing the survey was to ask students how this was affecting them. Uh, these were some of the categories that we have used uh, across all of the administrations. And so uh, this year we wanted to take another look and ask students, uh, you know, what was happening uh, and were these still problems for them? Um, so when a student uh, takes, signs up for a course and uh, is presented with the, the textbook and goes and finds the cost of that textbook, um, what's happening? Well, still, uh, the numbers are fairly high here. They're not purchasing their required textbook. They're taking fewer courses. They're not registering for a specific course. They may earn a poor grade, they feel, because they couldn't afford to buy the textbook and they may drop the course completely. In other words, they may sign up for the course, look at the cost of the textbook and say, I can't do that, drop that course and maybe find another course if they can, or maybe not find another course, just leave that course alone or leave that open. That is all not good news for, uh, for those of us in higher education because in Florida and in many other states, there's been a lot of focus on not only excess credit hours, time to degree, and overall completion to a degree. And to the extent that a student performs poorly in a course, doesn't register for a course, or drops a course, that is negatively impacting their progression toward finishing a degree. And in many states, there are performance measures, performance funding measures that provide additional funding to our institutions uh, depending upon student graduation and completion rates. So to the extent that, that, that the, this is having a negative impact on that number, it's not only costing us potential performance money, but it's also hurting our student progression and student success. And obviously the longer a student stays uh, at in our institutions and doesn't finish a degree, the more debt, potential debt and costs they're running up as well. I think it is worth noting that uh, uh, each negative impact category in this year's administration decreased by two to five percent. So the numbers are still higher than we want, obviously, but there is a trend or slight suggestion that these numbers may be coming down somewhat. And I can only 
conjecture that that is because of uh, the influence of open educational resources and steps that our institutions are taking to mitigate the cost of textbook for students, uh, i.e. rental programs and other opportunities that may be helping students uh, afford to get the resources that they need. Um, typically, this result would be uh, consistent with the trend and the reduction of textbook cost as reported by students in the previous slide. Um, so another question that we have asked students uh, through all of the administrations is, uh, how many times were you required to purchase a textbook and then that textbook was not used in the course? And this was initially quite troubling to us because we see a steady increase, uh, almost by one point uh, across all three administrations. And given the conversations that we've had in the state of Florida about these issues, uh, we were quite concerned that this was showing up on the part of students. So we did a little digging around and talking with our institution folks. And I, can, I don't have hard data to suggest what may be happening here, but I can offer a couple of hypotheses that certainly are something that bear further uh, uh, exploration. Uh, in our, our colleagues uh, in the library world certainly experienced uh, in their, as their business model changed to a more digital model, uh, a lot of the publishers were selling uh, subscriptions to paper journals. And uh, as things became more and more digital, a lot of libraries would say, we really want the digital version, we don't really want the hard copy. And a lot of the models said, well, we'll only provide you with the digital version if you purchase the hard copy. I think that something like that is also happening in the textbook space. I think that uh, more and more our faculty are relying more and more on the digital ancillary resources that come with the textbook, for example, PowerPoint slides, test banks, and things like that, digital content. And as we have seen a significant increase in distance learning courses, of the uh, offering of distance learning courses over the last five years, we've also seen faculty start to rely more and more heavily on digital content that is embedded inside the learning management system. Some of that content or a lot of that content is publisher created and owned content or licensed content. And the faculty members have access to that content based upon the usage or the selection of a textbook to be used in a course. So we think that what may be happening is students are purchasing uh, the textbook and the faculty are embedding the digital resources inside of the LMS and then students are relying almost where rightly or wrongly are relying heavily on the digital PowerPoint slides and resources and content that is placed in the learning management system. And they may or may not be utilizing the actual physical textbook that they purchased. And that may be in part what's contributing to this response. Another possible contribution here is uh, that uh, a lot of uh, textbooks are bundled. In other words, you go to the bookstore and you find a bundle that includes the paper, traditional hard copy textbook, a software code, or something, or a set of digital resources that you get as part of a bundle. And so students are purchasing the bundle, the bundle, and then they are utilizing the digital resources and may not be utilizing the hard copy paper textbook uh, as much. And so we think that student responses to this question are in part happening because the model of uh, selling the textbook and how they're bundling it with a paper copy may be, uh, may be uh, affecting the student response here. So um, that's something certainly we will be looking into and uh, something that, uh, that you may want to look into on your campuses in terms of how students are purchasing textbook and what's happening with them. So, um, so in general, uh, textbook costs are still negatively impacting student academic progress. Uh, we do think that the responses indicate that they are spending slightly less on textbook, and we think that that is an acceptance of not only some of the cost reduction strategies offered through campus bookstores, but obviously the increased use of open educational resources and cost mitigation strategies being employed by Florida colleges and universities uh, to help students uh, avoid high textbook costs. We do think that there is uh, the required purchase question uh, and the use of physical textbooks 
deserve some further study. Uh, we, we think that there is less use of physical paper textbooks and that the use of more digital resources may be affecting the response to that survey, but that may be a change in the actual, uh, mo uh, the actual s uh, for sales model of, of, uh, of textbooks. Uh, and we may see textbooks essentially, uh, paper textbooks at least, starting to go away or at least come into some other form. Uh, so, uh, for the next administration of the survey, we'll be taking a hard look at the questions that we're asking and how we're asking them to see if we can get at some of those, um, some of those issues. Um, as it relates to participation, and we've get, been asked this uh, uh, by a number of states and we're in active conversation with them. Um, if you uh, are from another state besides Florida and you would like to work with us on this survey and administer uh, the survey in your own state, we'd be happy to work with you. Uh, the process is fairly much the same. Uh, it's a very short participation agreement. Liaisons are required at the institution and at the state level. And then we can certainly add demographic questions or other questions uh, that you might want to have to ask your own students. Uh, and we can provide you with a checklist and an FAQ if that's something that you would like to do. We would welcome your participation. Our goal, obviously, is to increase the size of the data set to determine if the things that we're seeing in Florida with our 21,000 students are similar or the same across multiple states and across uh, the country and multiple situations. So the larger the data set that we can get, the more we can determine how widespread these things are across the country. And we may find that uh, other states, for example, have some different programs underway and we might see some different effects and we'd be very interested in determining if certain types of programs at the state level might have a, a significant effect on these questions uh, for that particular state. That would be very interesting to know in terms of effective strategies that might be in use in other states. So if it's something that you're interested in, either from an institutional perspective or a state perspective, just let us know and we'd be more than happy to work with you on uh, on uh, doing the survey uh, in your state. Uh, that's a brief overview of the highlights uh, of the survey uh, results so far. There is an executive summary of the results posted on our website, uh, and I'm sure Tom will send that out to the participants after the webinar. And the final report should be done uh, probably within the month with all of the frequencies and data appended in the rear. Uh, so uh, keep your eyes open for that. I'm sure as soon as we release it, Tom will also uh, send a link out to all of you who are participating on the webinar today. And I'd be happy to respond to other questions. Before I do that, let me say that the work of the survey has been something that we have enjoyed doing. Uh, uh, some of you may be familiar with Robin Donaldson who worked here. Robin is retired. And we wish her well, but uh, we would love to have her back. Uh, but Robin did a lot of work on this survey for a number of years. If you know Robin, uh, she's retired, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge her contribution to the survey. And Yi Shen, who's also done a lot of the analysis and work on the uh, survey data, also uh, has done a lot of the, most of the work on the survey. So uh, I would say that I am the uh, I get to be the presenter, for, but a lot of hard work went on behind the scenes with a lot of other folks. So uh, in any case, I'll stop there and uh, turn it back to Tom. Uh, Dr. Opper, we have a question here. Uh, Jeff asked, the number of participants equals the number of responses, correct? Not the number of people contacted who may respond. Um, the number, I think the number of participants that we're using, the 21,000, are the number of students who completed the full survey. If we look at all students who may have started the survey but did not complete the survey, I think that number is close to 25,000 students. But for the purposes of the analysis, we actually used only students who completed the full survey uh, of all, all questions. Uh, here is another question uh, coming from Cheryl. Did any of the survey questions ask whether students used OERs 
in their courses? I'm not sure that we asked that question this year. In a previous year, we did ask students that question, and we found, I think, that they were not particularly aware of that term or phrase. I think OER, or Open Educational Resources, was more of a confusing term for them at the time. So I don't believe we asked that question this year uh, in favor of asking some other questions that people wanted to know more about. Okay, um, those are the questions we have right now. And uh, uh, if you have more questions, feel free to type your questions by clicking on Q&A on top right of the screen and click send. We'd like to hear from you. Okay, uh, great. I mean, uh, certainly, uh, if later on, if you have more questions, please feel free to contact us. And, uh, uh, okay, uh, Rachel, Rachel just posted, um, it would be interesting to ask students if their textbooks were available from the bookstore or if the professor just recommended students rent the text. This happens to uh, Rachel as a student this fall. I would be. I, you know, this is one of those situations where once you see this data, you think of seven other questions you'd like to ask for almost every question you did ask to try to determine what's actually happening uh, behind those scenes of that, uh, that, uh, that question. Um, and it fights with us all the time in terms of our general curiosity uh, when you have a group of students this large that are answering this question. But we also are uh, have to be very disciplined in trying to keep the survey short and focused so we get that number. Uh, but you're right, it, it would be great to know a lot more and of course these questions make us think about other things we'd like to ask, but I'm particularly interested in following up with uh, uh, the one about uh, the use of the physical textbook. I think that's quite fascinating and may signal a trend, a change in the model in terms of what's happening with textbook worlds. We certainly see more and more of that and we certainly see a number of uh, our, uh, our institutional partners and, uh, like Lumen or other uh, 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 groups that work on low cost or OER resources towards uh, creating ancillary or digital resources to go with that content. So um, you're exactly right. And uh, you know, if you have other questions like that or other comments like that, we'll take all of them because as we think about doing the survey again in 2020, um, you know, there's always a question, there's always a chance that we always think about every question and should we throw one of these questions out that's really not getting us anywhere in favor of asking another question that might be more interesting or more provide more insight on what's happening. So send, send your ideas on. We would be happy to have them and uh, uh, we'll certainly take them under consideration for inclusion in the 2020 version. Thank you, Dr. Opper. And, uh... Thank you, Rachel, and we really appreciate that you um, provide some feedback from the student's perspective. We, we are happy to hear the student voice. Thank you. And um, Jen asked, uh, will the slides be available in, uh, sorry. Will the slides be available uh, separate from the recorded version of the webinar? Yes, uh, we will share the PowerPoint slide um, with you in addition to the webinar recording. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Stephanie asked, what recommendations do you have for academic, uh, bear with me, uh, my screen is a little small, so let's see. Please bear with me, let me enlarge my screen and, uh, okay. 
Stephanie asked,、uh, what what recommendations do you have for academic advisors when working with students regarding this topic?、Um, I don't know that I have any magic ones, but clearly the data suggests uh, that uh, I would certainly. Uh, Uh, I think most、uh, faculty understand that students usually will wait until the first day of class before purchasing their textbook. So I think it's important to go to class and get the syllabus. And as a previous comment there said, you know sometimes the faculty will say the book is recommended, not required.、Uh, you may want to rent this book, etc.,、uh, or they may say something like.、Uh, This is certainly a required textbook. However, most of the content we will use in the class will be used will be located in the learning management system. It's important to know what the faculty members' expectations are, and I think going to class the first day before jumping into the textbook purchase is an important important strategy. I think the other thing you should make them aware of is you know、uh, that there are other、uh, other options besides just purchasing the textbook off the shelf. The rental programs obviously have become much more flexible and viable. And、uh, I've heard a lot. We've heard a lot of anecdotal、uh, information from students about how they're doing this.、Uh, some students,、uh, a group of students, relayed to me that they they share a suite. So there's four students in a different suite, and they sort of、uh, are all taking a lot of the same classes. So they essentially created a library where they shared the cost, and the books stay in the in the suite, and they're all available for the four students who are all living there. So they sort of mitigated by sharing the cost. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do that, but I think as an academic advisor,、uh, I would say、uh, go to class the first day before you do anything, get the syllabus, and then look for some of the options offered by the campus bookstore as well as some of the other options available、uh, outside of the bookstore. That's certainly what students are doing. Diane asked, "Will this presentation be available after today for peers that couldn't make today's presentation?" Uh, yes, Diane. Uh, the presentation.、Um, Will be available、uh, web recording archive and the PowerPoint slide will be、uh, shared shared with you and your peers. Thank you. And、uh, Regina asks, are the survey questions available somewhere?、Uh, they are.、Uh, we certainly can make those available to you. I'll talk with Tom about that and we'll follow up on that. And then there was a question about the number of participants, which.、Uh, Is in one of the first slides. It's 21,000, just over 21,000 students, and all 40 of Florida's Florida's public college universities uh, uh, participated. They had students participating from all of Florida's colleges and universities on the public side. Well, thank you, Dr. Alper. I think you just answered、uh, the question、um, asked by Sheryl. And uh, uh, Stephanie commented, "A great idea to share the cost if roommates are in similar courses." Well, I can only say a, that was a student idea. So you know they're quite resourceful, and、uh, they have a lot of ways to to deal with this issue. So、uh, the, 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 their voice is valuable.、Uh, bear with me.、Um, Olga asked. Will you also include the link to the published information about the results of the surveys from 2012, 2016, and eventually 2018? The 2016 study is on the web. The 12, I think they're all on the web. I think they're in the Orange Grove, Tom.、Uh, if they're not in the Orange Grove repository, they're probably on our website. I'm sure Tom can send that link out to the previous surveys. Thank you. Well, thank you for your questions.、Um, do we have more questions for Dr. Alper before we wrap up the session? Oh, thank you, Jeff, for posting the link. If this、uh, topic is in, obviously if OER is interested to you. I know Tom's going to talk about an event that we have, but、uh, earlier. Uh, in 2018, in February of 2018, we did an open educational、uh, resources summit meeting.、Uh, the videos for all of the participants, including Cable Green from Creative Commons, the videos and all of the materials are available on our website.、Uh, I'm sure Tom can send that out as well. I'm making Tom work really hard today, and、uh, he's going to talk to you about our upcoming summit as well. 
Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Opper, and thank you, everyone, for your patience. And um, um, I will share the webinar recording and the related PowerPoint and links and the resources with you, with you afterwards. And um, I want to um, invite you to uh, participate at our second Open Educational Resources OER Summit on February 27 to 28 in Orlando, Florida. Uh, check out more information on the OER Summit website. The link is provided here, or you can do a quick Google search. Florida OER Summit. All right. Uh, okay, we have, we have one more comment here. Uh, Jeff mentioned it might be worse is to look into the orange glow metadata for these studies. It comes up in Google with a bunch of random numbers and the letters as the title. Yeah, I'll leave that to you, sir. Yeah, well, thank you, Jeff, for providing us feedback, and I definitely am interested in looking uh, for more details uh, and to see uh, what, what we can do with the metadata from the orange glow. And uh, um, uh, certainly, uh, there, it might be another study uh, in the future. But uh, thank you for your reminder. Okay. All right. Uh, any more questions for us? If not, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful day. <laughs>